So what I'm talking about is mathematical models of financial derivatives, uh, which, as explained here, are contracts or securities, the value of which depends upon the price of an underlying asset or the level of an interest rate or index of some kind. And that's quite important to explain because these models have much greater credibility than, for example, models of share prices. And the credibility arises because, of course, there are constraints on how a derivative and its underlying asset relate to each other. Uh, here are the sources that I'm drawing on, and I'll just say two quick little things about them. First of all, much of what I'm going to be talking about is about quants, which is the financial markets term for modelers. And secondly, this is a project that's taken an embarrassingly large number of years uh, to do. But one advantage of it taking that embarrassingly large number of years is that some of my interviews were conducted before the summer of 2007, which is, of course, the watershed moment here. This is the moment where the credit crisis became apparent. And that is just pure good fortune, because, of course, there's every reason to distrust interviews after that crisis, because, of course, the problem of hindsight uh, comes into them. So nearly all the quotes that are going to be on the slides are from those early interviews before the summer of 2007. Why the scare quotes around public? It's because the most natural place to look in what we did in the, the session of the meeting just before this is to look at media representations of economic life and then look, and then look at the way in which economic, economic knowledge is constituted in media outlets. Now there is such an outlet <coughs> in this area. It's the magazine um, called Risk. The reason for the square quote, the scare quotes, though, is that a subscription to Risk will cost you £1,199 a year, uh, or even with an academic discount, £783.30. Uh, so, this is £100 worth of magazine, uh, which actually shows my trust in Cambridge is a sort of classy university that I'm prepared to tell you that without worrying too much that somebody's going to nick it out of my bag during, during the reception. Risk. <laughs> Risk would actually be rather worth studying from the viewpoint of the kind of session um, that we've had. A lot of technical papers in the area I'm drawing upon appeared in Risk, and Risk employed its own professional reporters. So it's it's a very it's a very important constitutor of this of, of, of this field. But in essence, this is the core argument of what I'm going to be <coughs> saying: that derivative modelling taking place in trading, trading rooms such as this, in the so-called front offices of investment banks, is not a fully private activity. That it takes place in a quasi-public sphere that extends into other parts of each bank, into the middle office and back office where risk control and accounting functions take place, and also includes other investment banks. So there is an issue of relationships within each organization and also relationships amongst organizations here. And the talk is going to have five parts. I'm going to start by 
invoking <coughs> the notion of culture, which of course is a tricky and dangerous uh, kind of thing to do, because culture's got an interesting bifurcated recent history. On the one hand, it's everywhere now in public discourse. If anybody's taken a look, and don't imagine anybody has, but if anybody's taken a look at the Salts report on what went wrong in Barclays Bank, there's an 18-page appendix entitled, What is Culture and How Can It Go Wrong? <laughs> so on the one hand, it's everywhere. On the other hand, the professional practitioners of the notion above all our colleagues in anthropology, <coughs> have become deeply suspicious of it. However, I, I'm still actually kind of wedded to the notion because I think it's a useful, as it were, denaturalizing tool. And so I'm going to talk about the dominant form of modeling in derivatives in investment banking, martingale or risk neutral modeling. I'm going to talk about that as a culture. That is not and this is the reason for doing it. That's not how those people who do it think of it. They actually do still take it as just the way in which the world should be modeled. But I'm going to talk about it as a culture. Cultures, though, are not pure things. Cultures develop by bricolage. Kara Williams and his, his colleagues in, in Manchester have very usefully emphasized the role of bricolage in the recent history of finance. I'm going to talk about the Gaussian popular as an instance of bricolage. If you've heard of the Gaussian popular before, it's almost certainly because of this article, Felix Salmon's article, The Formula That Killed Wall Street. Uh, and if there's time, I suspect there may not be, I'll examine Solomon's argument in the final part of the talk. This, however, is, the, is actually the core of the talk from the viewpoint of the meeting in which this, this talk um, is part. Uh, the role of models in the, pub, in the public life of models in, in investment banking, and in particular, its connection to something I'll explain later on, day one p and I've asked Tiago, so I don't want to miss out on this bit. I've asked Tiago to tell me when there are 10 minutes to go of the talk. And uh, I will move directly to that. And we may need to do this uh, for, the, for the final discussion if, if, if anyone is interested. So, culture. <clears throat> I'm here very deliberately using a really quite traditionalist notion culture, some things that you might want in a concept of culture, and applying that to the dominant form of derivatives modelling in investment banking. One thing the culture promotes is, of course, shared practices. And here, very brief, I mean, this is all very schematic, of course, this is the dominant form of practice. If you've got a derivative and you want to price it or analyze its risks, you work out the replicating portfolio, this continuously adjusted set of more basic products that is the same payoffs as a derivative in all states of the world. You set the price of the derivative as the cost of the replicating portfolio, plus, of course, your profit margin. And you actually use the replicating portfolio to hedge the risks of the derivative. But of course, cultures aren't just practices. They also involve beliefs. Beliefs, for example, about what the world is made up of. They involve ontologies and the characteristic of what I'm talking about is that those who practice the form of modeling I'm describing see things that others do not see. <coughs> or risk neutral probabilities. There are 
two sort of ways of explaining them. One is on the handout, but that would actually just take too long to go through the talk. So I'm going to draw upon one of my favourite textbooks in this area, Baxter and Rennie's 1996 Financial Calculus, which begins with what they call the parable of the bookmaker. They imagine us, they, they ask us to imagine what is literally a two-horse race and a bookmaker setting the odds. The bookmaker is assumed to know the actual probabilities of each horse winning and following the conventions in this area, blackboard bold, blackboard bold character P represents the actual probability. So let's assume that horse one has a chance of one in four of winning, horse two has a chance of one in of three and four in winning, and so therefore the bookmaker sets the odds according to those probabilities. If the bookmaker does that in the long run, he or she will break exactly even, but of course in the short run, any one given race, they can lose very heavily indeed. There's a quite different strategy available to the bookmaker, however, which is to set the odds according to how much is bet on each horse. So imagine that $5,000 is bet on horse one, and $10,000 is bet on horse two. Then whatever the actual probabilities of each horse winning, the bookmaker can guarantee no loss by setting those odds. Then whatever happens, the bookmaker breaks exactly even. Of course, natural practice, bookmakers make a profit, but we're setting, we're setting that aside. So there's a different kind of probability the bookmaker could use. Probability that's determined by the amounts of money that are bent. A probability theorist would talk about this as a shift of measure from the actual probabilities of each outcome to what are at least a loose analogue of the risk neutral or marking deal probabilities of finance. Those are recodings of prices, as one of my interviewees put it. They're not statements of the past, he went on to say. They're not statements about the act of, what's got, of, of, of actual frequencies that have taken place in the past, nor are they necessary, nor are they necessarily predictions about the future. They're recodings of the day's prices. And that is the framework in which Martin is risking neutral modelers work. And it's linked to the replicating portfolio strategy that mm -hmm. I talked about, and the, the little handout mm -hmm. actually tries to explain the nature of that link. Other things one might expect from a culture is, for example, <coughs> the notion of aesthetics. Again, I like this quote from this text, Financial Calculus, <coughs> seeing beauty in financial mathematics. One would expect from a notion of culture an idea of talk, an idea of communication, both linguistic and non-linguistic. Here, for example, in the mathematics of <coughs> options, traders talk about options in terms of implied volatility, which is the volatility of the underlying asset that's consistent with the price of the option, and you sort of run the Black-Scholes model backwards to extract that, and it gives you a very useful shorthand for communicating about options, which are complicated and 
kinds of things. Now, I said that, of course, the notion of culture is under a shadow in the social sciences, and in many ways, rightly so. And there are two prominent risks in invoking culture. The first is that you can be heard as invoking what the sociologist Harold Garfinkel called the cultural dope. The actor that has the scripts of his or her culture in their head and simply acts out those scripts. It's not a useful model of human being. It's got its analog here, very common actually when people talk in, 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 about the role of models in finance. The analog of the cultural dope is the model dope, the person who simply believes the output of the model. I've yet actually to meet a model dope, at least amongst those people who develop or very actively use models. So I don't think that the crisis I know can properly be explained by the conventional story in which there are these people in banks and they're either greedy or they're stupid, and if they're stupid, it's the stupidity is blind faith in I don't think that's I don't think that's a correct form of, of explanation. <clears throat> the other risk of the notion of culture is of course the risk of essentialism, the implicit positing of culture as bounded and as internally coherent, as internally homogeneous. And of course that's also false. All cultures borrow, all cultures change, all cultures are heterogeneous, and all cultural change is bricolage. And the history of the Gaussian copula is a history What's a Gaussian copula? Well, what's it, what it's used for in finance is to model the probability distribution of losses from a pool of loans or bonds. And in particular, it's used to model collateralized debt obligations. So this may be a little hard to read from the back, but with my apologies. Uh, so what you want is a pool of loans, bonds, or the form of quasi-insurance against default called credit default swaps. You've got cash flow from that pool, and you've got a set of securities which are sold, which are claims on that cash flow. And imagine it as a waterfall coming in at the top, the senior tranche of securities, which have the first claim on the cash flow, and therefore are the safest. But don't pay, don't pay you a lot of money. A typical coupon on the, on the senior tranche of a CDO would be the London Interbank for weight LIBOR, which you used to have to explain when, when you gave talks. <laughs> That's not much of an increment, not much of a spread, because this is the safest tranche or set of tranches. And as you go down through mezzanine and down into equity, then risks increase, but so does return. So that's what a CDO is, and the task of modeling a CDO is in good part the task of understanding 
what the probability distribution of losses on a pool of loans or bonds is going to look like. And that was the task taken on at the end of the 1980s, initially an entirely private work, quite, quite literally private, this was commercially confidential work. Vazicek was working for <laughs> diversified corporate loans, and I'm not going to the detail of the firm, but as you can imagine from that title, it, it, one of his jobs was to model losses on pools of loans. Vazicek was a probability theorist. He was a refugee from the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. He drew on the Martindale, this mutual kind of tradition that I've been, that I've been talking about in the modeling of default risk for an individual firm, but imposed something that wasn't really part of that tradition the dependent structure of a multi-dimensional Gaussian or normal distribution. And that's the start of what's become known as, of the, as the Gaussian popular family of models. It's probably not particularly useful to dwell on it mathematically, <coughs> but I do want just quickly to show you, because I think this is the best way to capture what a Gaussian popular model does. I want to actually show you a couple of slides of Gaussian popular output. What Vazicek did, he tried to get the general solution to the problem, couldn't find a general solution, but he managed to find a tractable special case, which has become known as the large homogeneous pool. As the name implies, it's made up of lots or lots of loans, and they're homogeneous in the sense that each firm in the pool, each firm that's got the debt obligation that's in the pool, has the same probability of default. In the case of my graphs, that probability is 0 0.02. And it's also homogeneous in the sense that the correlation between the market values of any pair of firms is the same. So all that's going to vary in the slides I'm going, to, I'm going to show you is that correlation number. <coughs> so here's what you get, the correlation of 0 0.01. Each firm, remember, has got a probability of default of 0 0.02. Very little correlation amongst them. So essentially, you can use 0 0.02 in the pool. This is very close to what statisticians call the law of large numbers, which you get if the correlation is actually zero, but this is, this is next, next to zero. What happens as the correlation increases is that the distribution fattens out, so to speak. Um, the scale, you may not be able to read this again at the back, but the scale is changing, so don't worry, but don't worry about the scale, just look at the shape the distribution. Here, really it's only that bottommost tranche, equity, that's going to be at risk. But as the distribution fattens out, so you can see risks to the higher tranches, the supposedly safer tranches of the CEO. <coughs> and if you tweak the correlation all the way up to 0 0.99 is 0 0.1, Again, 0 0.99. Then it's rather nice, and when I've talked about this in the past, and a couple of people have heard, here, heard me do that, I, I make the joke that this pleases my heart as an old Marxist, because if, you're, if you were an old-fashioned Marxist, you used to believe in the terminal crisis of capitalism, and here is the mathematical shadow of the terminal crisis of capitalism. The shape of the probability distribution has become bimodal. Either nothing defaults, or everything defaults. And if everything defaults, then even the safest tranche of a CDO is at risk of wipeout. Vazicek's work <coughs> was only 
the start of the condition that it, it, popular functions didn't actually get introduced really explicitly until the late 1990s in the work of David Lee, then working for the Canadian International Bank of Commerce. But someone in the field would recognize this as a family of models of broadly the same type. And by 2003, 2004, a market was created of which these were the canonical models. I mean, there's, there's an interesting set. There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting chronology there that the, the model was created before the market of which these are the models, the so-called index market. I mentioned implied volatility as a way in which people communicate in the options market. In this market, people communicated with implied correlation. Running the Gaussian copula backwards to infer the value of correlation that was implicit in the prices, in the spreads on the on, 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 on the C, on the standardized CDO tranches. And indeed, that correlation became at least partially reified. When I was starting doing these interviews in 2005 and 2006, you could actually meet people who were called correlation traders. <coughs> so you've got set of models, and you've got a market of which these are models, and in which, in a sense, they're good models representationally. They fitted the market perfectly, as one interviewee put it to me. In other words, using a Gaussian company before, you could reproduce the pattern of the price of prices in the market exactly. But nonetheless, even before the prices, there was quite a degree of unhappiness, at least amongst points, again, amongst modelers, with Gaussian copper models. Two quite separate reasons for the unhappiness. The first form of unhappiness wasn't just an unhappiness of quants. Others in the market, traders and the like, shared it as well. It was a phenomenon known as the correlation. And that was, in essence, is that if you ran your Gaussian copula backwards to get implied correlation out, what you got would vary according to what tranche you were looking at. There was a sense in which that's a complete logical inconsistency because, because the correlation is an aspect of this. It's an aspect of the pool of loans or of the corporations underpinning those loans. So it shouldn't depend on this particular structure, this particular financial structure, but it did depend on it. Correlation should have been flat, but it wasn't flat. It was skewed. But I also found a second form of dissatisfaction. And it's the second form of dissatisfaction that's the reason why the notion of culture tantalizes me here. Because of course, one thing that cultures do is they other. They say who is not part of them. They say what is not part of them. And the quants I spoke to, even before the crisis, othered the Gaussian copula, quite markedly. So here are a variety of quotes from those early interviews. It's not a model. One point told me. One D. 
particularly interesting figure here because Planck D had actually made crucial technical contributions to the development of Gaussian popular models. Kind of it sort of explained why you might say that the Gaussian popular is a popular <coughs> model. And what he's essentially saying in the quotation is that it's not a model like Black Scholes, like the canonical option pricing model. It's not a risk neutral martingale model. It's not a model in which you derive prices by identifying, identifying a replicating portfolio and working out the cost of the replicating portfolio. I wasn't looking for criticism of the Gaussian popular. I just kept stumbling upon people criticizing the Gaussian popular, being unhappy with the Gaussian popular. So that had a nice side effect for me in the people such as Blunt D, who told me this is a terrible model, but nonetheless were using the model, had actually to produce for me just a, a necessity of that kind of conversation with someone who would say to someone, this is a terrible model, but you also say to someone I'm using it. They had to explain to me why they were using the Gaussian popular. And that's where <coughs> we come to the main thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, tell, tell me when those 10 minutes are up and I'll just stop. <coughs> here is Kolmogorov and the measure theoretic reconceptualization of probability theory, which is one of the great achievements of 20th century mathematics. And it's beautiful maths. I can quite understand why someone looks at this sphere of modeling and can say, this is not just useful, this is, this is beautiful. But it's also very directly tied. This is not free floating. It's very directly tied to one of the most important economic phenomena in investment banking, which is day one, P and L. P and L is the acronym for profit and loss. And of course, as we all know, that's the main determinant of the trader's bonus. The kinds of derivatives I'm talking about are long duration <coughs> contracts. Maybe five years, maybe 10 years, maybe even 30 years. 30 years is certainly beyond the likely working lifetime of a trader in a bank. Indeed, in the period I was looking at, there a lot of circulation amongst banks. Even five years is beyond the likely working lifetime in a particular bank of a trader. So what day one P and M is, is the ability to capture all the present value of the profits from the derivatives contracts you, that you've set up now. In other words, take its profit, to book its profit now, to capitalize all that income stream as profit now, rather than simply to accrue it year by year as that profit is actually coming in. And it's critically important to traders in the, of these kinds of derivatives that they get day one P&L on their, on their deals. It wasn't too difficult to get day one P&L until 2001 and the Enron bankruptcy 
But D1 P&L played an important role in Enron's financial reporting. And after the Enron bankruptcy, regulators started to lay down conditions that had to be met before you could get D1 P&L. And accountants and auditors, and of course auditors terrified by the fate of Enron's auditor, Arthur Anderson, started to be particularly anxious here too. They started to lay down that you needed at least two conditions to be met before you could get day one PM on the derivatives deal. Your model had to be market standard. It had to be what other people were using. And its parameters had to be observable. And indeed, some of my interviews, interviewees claimed, I don't think entirely correctly, but I think it, this, this, this touches an important phenomenon, the index markets were actually set up so as to make correlation observable, so that traders could continue to get day one p and on their deals. And secondly, you could position the index markets Amongst the things that those criteria did was to link trading and modeling in the front office with the risk controllers in the middle office and the accountants in the back office. So within a bank, models, they already had some of this, but this was intensified after 2001, models started to have to play this quasi-public role within the bank. Among the things this does is to build path dependence in the Arthur David sense into the history of modeling. Because once a model becomes a market standard, and it may be quite accidental, just in the case of the QWERTY keyboard, what happens to become market standard. Once it becomes market standard, it becomes hard to dislodge it. There are costs of loss of coordination involved if you use a model other than the market standard. You may not appear to be properly hedged because your risk, your risk controllers are using the Gaussian popula and you're using a substantially different model, then the hedging parameters your model are going to produce are not going to be the same as those produced by the Gaussian popula. So your risk controllers are going to your, your risk controllers are going to say to you, hey, you're not properly hedged, you're not getting day one of your mail. Your accountants, likewise, may not accept that you should be getting day one P&L again because you're using not the market standard model. And you can look back at a particularly interesting service called Totem. <laughs> Originally set up by a firm of that name and then in, during the period I was um, studying, it was taken over by Market, which is M-A-R-K-I-T, not E-T, which is a major firm in the derivatives area. And what Totem is that every month it creates a set of hypothetical CDOs and sends that set to the different investment banks and says to those, says to those banks, price these, price, price these CDOs and send the results back to them. Of course, what, that, what happens is this, get, this task gets passed to the, the quants in the front office and they do the pricing and it goes back to Totem. And what you get back from the service is everybody's distribution of prices, anonymized, you don't know exactly how other people are doing it, and where you are on that distribution. And of course, where you want to be is right in the middle. You don't want to be on either edge. But if you're using a model that's different from what everybody else is using, then there's a risk you will be on the edge. And indeed, if you're beyond two standard deviations from the mean, I, I'm, I'm told, I've not, never been able to get, 
chapter and verse from this, you would actually be cut off from the totem system because people, were th people would start to think you were manipulating it in a LIBOR uh, kind of fashion. Quantine, you just told me that the Gaussian popular was a terrible model. Explain to me why, nonetheless, he had to use the Gaussian popular. You can't say I've got this most fantastic model, in other words, a non-standard model that you think is better than the Gaussian popular. You can't do that. You have to be able to say, I've a hundred name of four who just play the fire, got the Gaussian popular base correlation model to the market standard. That effectively allows me to do a 10-year trade and book P&L today. Without that, people would be in serious trouble. All their traders would leave because it's day one P&L is so important to and go to competitors. Or, as another point, to put it more succinctly, when the auditors of finance, finance, Accountancy arm of the bank come in to look at our books. We have to be market standard. Okay, I think I'm going to stop at that point. Yeah, yeah, there, there, the, there is stuff in counter performance activity that could come up in discussion, but I don't want to absorb the time of the discussion. I'll possibly stop yeah, that. Thank you very much.